you talk about these guys in 1939 crushing through calories. Like, why is that a good thing? I, I just think that when I look around the world and knowing that, like, look at historical cultures, like, I just think people used to eat more calories. And I think that it's, um, I, I don't know that that's good or bad. Maybe you can but, get more nutrients that way too. I mean, well, that's, I mean, that's what they say in, yeah. in the USDA book of agriculture. It's like, yeah, the more food you eat, it's better because you're getting more calcium and you're getting more vitamins and you're getting more protein. You're getting more, all these things. And it's all, it's all to the good. If you eat mm -hmm. more, right. If you can afford to eat and more, not get which, fat. Yeah. <laughs> and right. But back then fatness wasn't a problem. Yeah. Right. And, and the richer you were, the more you ate and the probably the healthier you were and the longer you lived, etc. And that's why I think, you know, I'm like, well, something changed. And, and, and that's again, and I, I think that the vegetable oil was the triggering event. And then I think that our metabolism, uh, that's a trigger to enter into this torpid alternative metabolism. And then, you know, you start overproducing, overproducing SCD1 and your desaturase index goes up. Now you're in like living in like this fat storing mode and and like yeah. you say it's it's associated with overeating, it's associated with storing fat, it's associated with all these things. And so it's like I think we've I think many of us have found our way into a torpid metabolism. And so mm. I'm just trying to I'm just trying to figure out how to get out of get it. Out you of know? It. Yeah. You don't want to <laughs> eat for winter. That yeah, that you don't want to be getting ready for hibernation. And that's what right, we're, right. we're in and, a perpetual I, mode of that. Eat human. Les humains à leur meilleur. Welcome back, friends. I'm Brian Sanders, and this is the Peak Human Podcast, where I talk to the world's leading health experts, doctors, researchers, and regenerative agriculture experts about how to live your best life. Please start back at episode one, or at least try to work your way backwards. Each episode is a valuable piece of the puzzle. Please also give this podcast a review on the Apple Podcast app so we can reach more people. Today, I had the pleasure of speaking with Brad Marshall, who's a great guy who raises low PUFA hogs and has a lot to say about PUFAs versus saturated fat. Brad adds to the great lineup of guests talking about the dangers of these unstable polyunsaturated fatty acids. He'll get deep into the science on why they're bad for humans and why they're what's to blame for many or most health problems and chronic disease. You won't want to miss this one. Brad's work is based on his understanding of molecular biology, his love of food history and cooking, and his experience in agriculture. To that end, he has a genetics degree from Cornell University and a culinary certificate from the French Culinary Institute. After college, he did cancer research at Memorial Sloan Kettering and did bioinformatics for the Berkeley Drosophila Genome Project before leaving professional science. For the previous 15 years, he has raised rotationally grazed hogs and runs a retail butcher shop and USDA-inspected meat processing plant. Brad has written extensively about meat processing and meat science, including disastrous trends in American bacon. He is also a student of culinary history and historical diets. He goes deep down a rabbit hole in the middle of the episode on the electron transport chain and goes into some pretty esoteric stuff. I hope we don't lose anyone for these 12 to 14 minutes. Some people may really appreciate learning how the body produces energy down to this level, but if that's not you, then feel free to skip ahead. There's a lot of valuable info we cover after this part, so make sure you finish off the episode. At my company, Nose of Tail, we also raise low PUFA with high omega-3 ratio pigs. We do chicken as well. Check that out at nosetotail.org. We also have the primal beef, which is by far our best seller. It has liver, heart, kidney, and spleen mixed into the grass-finished ground beef and tastes spectacular. I keep getting reports of how people's kids love it, maybe even more than they do themselves. Our seasonings are available with your custom box. I use them every meal, actually. I always put the ranch in yogurt as a sauce, but I'll also use the fresh catch on smoked oysters, the primal on any and all meats, and a new thing I did was put the Thai seasoning on baked sweet potatoes. Now that was something special. They are fresh ground and have no fillers or funny stuff. I also just got a new batch of biltong and drovors in. Biltong makes beef jerky a thing of the past. It's air dried, so it's softer, uses no sugars or preservatives, has extra grass fed healthy fat on it, and of course, tastes amazing. We have five flavors to try, so try them out today at nosetail.org. We also just added a custom cutting board with the Nose to Tail logo etched in. Use it as your plate or just chop up some of our fine meats on it. All of our boxes have free shipping options, whether for the fresh meat or the other products. For everything else we're doing, check out sapien.org. 
Join the newsletter there for our weekly roundup of the best content from around the web, including our own original articles and videos. That's all at sapien.org. Now, please enjoy this episode with my pal, Brad Marshall. All right, Brad Marshall, we got to get this thing recorded. We can't just talk forever beforehand. How's it going? <laughs> uh, it's going great. It's going great. Yeah, I'm excited to excited to be here and uh, talk about torpor and some other fun things. Oh, yeah. We'll get into some torpor. We'll get into some fats. We'll get into some controversy, maybe. Maybe some people Excellent. listening, they're like, what is this guy talking about? Croissants. You shouldn't eat croissants. <laughs> I thought we knew this. No, uh, this is – I'm doing some podcasts lately with some different ideas. You know, this is – we're not always doing stuff on, you know, one way of thinking about things. I just did one with a guy from kind of the pro metabolic world. I don't know if you've heard of this guy, Keith Littlewood. He's kind of researcher, looks into No. Yeah, well, he you know, he's getting into this stuff. It's a little bit of like this rape heat type stuff. You know, people know about him, right. maybe. I've you know, I've just been hearing about his stuff for years, trying some of this I've, stuff out. I've often been compared to Ray Pete, but I, I haven't actually read I've read very little of Ray Pete's stuff and I listened to him on like, like one podcast, but we definitely have some similarities of thought. Um, and people are constantly asking me about Ray Pete, but I don't, <laughs> I don't know what to tell them because I don't really know anything about him, but <laughs> he's no, I know he's like this mythical character. He's like this, got this cult behind him and everyone's like, Oh, Ray Pete's the man. And I, I felt the same way where I don't know anything about him, but I do agree with some of the things he's like, yes, yeah, saturated fats, good. Poofas are bad. You know, eat organ meats like all this type of stuff is great so same, right. same thing with this keith littlewood guy it's like we actually agreed on a lot of stuff but then he just had this other idea with with sugar but this is what you're talking about here with starches are okay so that's what i'm saying this is maybe weird for people to hear but it actually kind of agrees with a lot of stuff once you hear it all out so we'll get to the bottom of this you'll hear the the full story and i feel like it sometimes it's a troubleshooting thing too like the guy i had on last time was Poor people who had hypothyroid and they had low body temperature and that, you know, this is one right. way to do things. So I'm not saying it's the only way. And then you're talking about, you know, all the stearic acids, croissant diet, we'll, we'll get beyond that. But it's not that everyone has to do it. It's just interesting. Right. Yes. Yeah. So let's start. So tell us about yourself. You have a degree from Cornell. What is it in? What do you do? Yeah, I've got a degree from Cornell in, in genetics. Um, basically, I was a molecular biologist after college. Uh, I did cancer research at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And then um, I worked for the uh, Berkeley Drosophila Genome Project as a, actually doing computer programming. So that was a little bit of a turn. And then I left all of that behind. And I came to Churnsburg, New York, and I started a pastured a uh, pork farm um, and I was raising pigs out on pasture and I was actually running a butcher shop and doing meat processing. And so I really have spent 15 years running a butcher shop and raising pastured pigs. Um, and so that, that actually, believe it or not, informs a lot of my work because what, one of the things I'm going to be talking about today that you already referenced is the idea of eating starch and a, um, and, and so, you know, the, my blog, so I write fire in a bottle uh, if you want to check out the blog. But I talk a lot about mitochondrial science and what happens in the mitochondria and the difference between um, burning saturated fat and unsaturated fat in your mitochondria. And one of the things that I, that I realized while raising the pigs is if pigs are fed a diet that is almost all starch, they have very saturated fat um, because – we and pigs can only make saturated fat from starch. That's the first step in lipogenesis. Like if you only eat starch, then your body fat by definition has to be made from the starch that you eat. And the body can only make um, saturated, something called palmitic acid is the first step when you do de novo lipogenesis. And then um, based on the amount of um an enzyme called SCD1 that you make, your body can turn a certain percentage of it into monounsaturated fat. But we can't make polyunsaturated fats. And um, humans and pigs who eat mostly starch tend to have very saturated fat. And I realized that in the butcher shop, um, just by looking at old documents, like you can see in, in documents from the 1800s, um, when they talk about uh, bacon sold in Europe, it says that you know American bacon 
sold at a discount in European markets in the 1800s because it was soft, because the pork was soft. Mm. And why is it soft? It's soft because Americans uh, finished our pigs on, on corn and, and in Europe, they finished their pigs on barley and corn is oilier than barley is. And so the American pigs had more, um, polyunsaturated fat in the in the fat content and so the fat was and so polyunsaturated fats are liquid at room temp or at, at even at refrigerator temperatures like soybean oil if you put it in your refrigerator it never turns solid unlike butter which is more saturated it's hard at room temperature at refrigerator temperature right and so so the more basically the more polyunsaturated fats that you feed pigs or humans it can kind of like bioaccumulate in your fat tissues and the fat gets softer. And in the butcher shop, this is real dramatic because if you have a pig whose fat is full of polyunsaturated fats, it's like greasy and it's floppy and it's not great. But if it's, if it's, um, has, if it's made primarily of saturated fat, then it's, it's firm and it's solid and you can slice it and it's, and it's nice to work with. And so that's, so, so that is where I got the idea of, promoting the you know pork that's low in polyunsaturated fats um so that's another thing i'm doing right now is firebrand meats and we sell low poof of pork and that's fun and it's it's really great pork and it's shipping now so i'm very excited about that but um because one of the things that's happened is especially over the last as we changed pig genetics in the 90s is is the amount of polyunsaturated fat in our pork and in our poultry in america has like steadily increased as we've fed them, well, we've always fed them corn, but um, during the um, in the early part of the 2000s, we made all these. Um, uh, we started turning like 30 or 40 percent of the American corn crop into ethanol, and these plants all across the Midwest were making ethanol. We burn in our gas tanks, and what we're doing is we're sending corn to these plants, and they're removing the starch, and that becomes the ethanol, and then what's left over is like the fiber and the protein and the oil. And so we, we then take that and we're, we're now feeding it to pigs. Um, and so the diets that we're giving the pigs has actually become oilier in the last, mm. you know, 20 years. And, and so pork is becoming more and more. It's, it's pretty easy to get a pig or a chicken up to be about 30% polyunsaturated fat, which is quite a bit more linoleic acid which is omega-6 polyunsaturated fat than is in canola oil for instance so most pork sold in the u.s has as much or more linoleic acid than canola oil as like a baseline yeah um for listeners who probably a lot of listeners have probably been avoiding vegetable oils in general but they didn't realize that there's just as much of the polyunsaturated fat as their bacon as there is in the canola oil that they threw away right it's um the stuff is good. Yeah, let me jump in and kind of recap. Yeah, you, you kind of like just spilled all the beans all at once. Yeah. I was say, that, was, that was a weird tangent. Uh, no, no, There's no, lots more to talk about. It's all good, you, <laughs> but I want to break it down a little slower. So people know who are listening know about the, how yeah, bad seed oils is. You don't want the polyunsaturated fats. And so we're here avoiding all the seed oils, but you could be getting them eating conventional chicken and pork because they're monogastric animals. They build up the PUFAs in their diet, same as us if you eat the PUFAs, but then if you're eating starch, you make saturated fat, like you're saying, or if you eat saturated fat, you just, you know, have saturated fat, but then cows, since they have a different digestive system can, uh, not do that as much. Right. So they can eat it in, even if they do have more poof in their diet, they kind of convert it into the saturated fat. So that's why people exactly. yeah, eating beef usually do better. And you can kind of get some problems if you're eating conventional chicken and pork. Right, but we can make chicken and pork th that isn't loaded with polyunsaturated fat if we if we want to. Um, so that's one of the things that I'm that I'm yeah. trying to do. But well, I I love that. We'll talk about that at the end because I have nose to tail, and we do you know grass finished beef and all the stuff with the organs and all that. Right. But we also do the chicken and the pig, the pork, I guess, with the different ratio. Like we very low omega six. And it's, right. it has a bit, way better omega-3 ratio, but I want to know what you think about even omega-3s. I mean, we're talking with the guy Keith last week about even the omega-3s couldn't be so great. Yeah, I think sometimes they're not. I think in, in very small amounts, they're probably beneficial, but probably very small amounts is enough. 
Yeah, so uh -huh. the best might be just a low PUFA pork in general because omega-3s are a PUFA, but they're known as the good one, but just having low PUFA pork in general. So I'm interested. I'm actually maybe changing my supply chain with nose to tail, oh, right. and uh, maybe we should talk. I don't want yeah, to, we should talk. After. I don't want to encroach on your business <laughs> or anything, but no, it's all good. Yeah, I love that you're you're doing it and you're feeding them a different diet, and it you get a different fatty acid profile. So that's really cool. But yeah, let's get into that later. But let's talk about why sure. it's bad to eat right. these polyunsaturated fats. Right, and so I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna back up for a second, and uh, I kind of mentioned this before, but I, I want to frame this. So you know, one of the things. I'm also, I love food. I went to the French Culinary Institute when I was in New York and I'm, I'm, I love the history of food and thinking about how it's changed. And so, you know, one of the things that I, I, I don't believe that, um, you know, the thing driving the obesity em epidemic is sloth or gluttony or even a quote, obesogenic food environment. Um, you know, my, my belief is that what caused it is an underlying metabolic change. And the reason I think that is that, um, so I've been reading a lot. I have this um, USDA yearbook of agriculture from 1939. And, you know, I have all kinds of quib quibbles with the USDA, but one thing they're, they're really good at is collecting data. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, so they published in 1939 uh, in this book, there's one chapter and it's called, um, it's called present day diets. And, um, one of the things they, <laughs> it, one of the things that's really interesting about it is in the thirties, um, wealthier families who could afford to bought more food and ate more food. So you have a, you have this very real situation where, um, those who could afford to buy and eat more food did, and they seemingly did so with impunity and, so for in for instance, what I mean is that um, the richest families in, in what they call Pacific Coast cities, so I assume they're talking about San Francisco, LA, uh, you know, Portland, Seattle, um, an average man in, according to the USDA, in 1937 or so was consuming perhaps uh, over 5,000 calories a day, or at least you know, purchasing. they were, they were purchasing 5,100 calories of food a day. And anyone who knows people from that generation, they were very thrifty back then, right? They didn't like to waste. They presumably didn't throw away a lot of food. That was all food that was going to be cooked and eaten in the home for the most part back then. Um, and so what you see is you see, you know, when you look at historical and in East coast cities, uh, you know, it was a little bit less, but it was still like the wealthiest families were eating 4,500 calories a day per adult male. And that's, you know, when you think about, okay, um, people say, oh, well, they exercise more or they, you know, but I'm like, well, why would a banker, right? If I'm the wealthiest family in New York, I'm probably either a banker mm -hmm. or I'm a lawyer um, or I'm an advertising executive, right? These are not... Um, these are not physically active jobs. The subway system was completed around 1900. Uh, all the buildings had elevators. So, you know, this is a person who lives presumably in an apartment somewhere in the city, takes a cab or the subway to work, takes the elevator up to his office, sits at his office all day, and then comes home at the end of the day. Like, I, I, can't, I can't imagine why they would have been, you know, and when you think about things like jogging and working out, like, the job it wasn't invented, invented yet yeah right it wasn't invented yet it literally like the idea of rec recreational jogging literally wasn't a thing in, yeah. in the 30s and so you know so i look at this usda data and i'm like well i don't know according to the usda data the wealthiest probably least active men in 1939 were eating 4500 or 4000 plus calories a day let's say and yet there's no there's not a single word you know it's like a 20 page article and there's not a single word around the idea that consuming too many calories has a downside. Mm -hmm. Like according to the USDA back then it was like, well, more calories is good. More food is good because you're getting more nutrients, you're getting more vitamins, you're getting more protein, you're getting more of all these things. And there, and it's 
it's all the good. The more food yeah. you can afford to buy and eat, you should do that. Right. Yeah. And that was what they, that they was, were walking around slim. They weren't, it was, <laughs> they, yeah, <laughs> right. Exactly. And so you're like, okay, so you have this rich, presumably fairly sedentary population, 4,000 calories a day. And so that's why I think that, you know, and then when you look at like, um, Nana's natural national nutrition survey, you know, studies of what people eat now, you know, it's, it's, it's less than that. We know that, that people are not eating that much now. And so, you know, it seems like people are, have become obese in the face of certainly, we're certainly not eating more now than we were. Yeah. Then. Less calories. If anything, if anything, it's less calories and we've become obese. And so that's why, you know, and, and I'll just throw in one more anecdote along those lines. Um, uh, T. Colin Campbell, who I have all kinds of hmm. problems with his science and blah, blah, blah. But he, they did do a really good study in China where they, they went to China in the early 80s. Um, and they literally, you know, weighed every gram that went into people's mouths. They went into people's homes while they cooked dinner. They measured everything. They collected a huge amount of data. And what he said when they first released that study in the early 90s was the least active Chinese person ate 30% more calories than an American, you know, of the same size and physical stature and was lean, you know? And it's like, so, so there's all these anecdotes of different populations that are not necessarily physically active, eating lots of calories and staying lean. And so those kinds of things are at the, that's why I think that, you know, our issue is not too many calories, but in fact, it's, it's a metabolic change. It, yeah. It's the quality of the calories. And this is what we talk about here a lot. And I love that. Yeah. T -call, Denise Minger did a great debunking of his thing. He's like a vegan doctor, but there's so many right. things he, he left out. Like there was a Tuoli province that ate the most meat and the most fat and they lived the longest and were the healthiest, but he just decided to not talk about that. So, right. Yeah. No, he, they, he literally just leaves them out of all of his published papers. Like, like I said, I have a billion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, it's good. I, so I, I, I live in Ithaca. T Colin Campbell lives in Ithaca. So he like does events at like the local food co-op and stuff. So he's like, he's, you know, he's low. He's very local to me. I see him around town. Oh, man. <laughs> so it's just a funny thing. It's a small city, but I love, but I love the actual data from the China health study. It's fascinating. You know, it really like, it's like yeah. kind of mind blowing. So they it's weren't great. eating the seed oils. They, they were not eating the seed oils. They were eating almost all starch. Yep. And, and like I said, um, so one of the things that happens when you eat mostly starch is your body fat is very saturated. And so this, this turns out, I think, is a key, is a really key point. Um, the more that I research and look into it, I think that people with very, if you have very saturated body fat, um, you are likely to have a high metabolic rate and stay fairly lean. Um, and so what happened in the U.S. over the past, so... Um, to back this up, there's an article on my blog. Um, I think it's called something like the body fat of starch eaters is very saturated. And so in 1962, they did it. They went to uh, Nigeria and they looked at um, they looked at, at farmer farming tribes in Nigeria and and um, and they looked at their they, they did a, a sample of their adipose tissue. And in fact, and they went to a small town in Indiana and took an adipose tissue sample there. And, um, and in fact, what they found was that, um, you know, the, the Nigerian farmers who were eating mostly starch and, and um, they, cause they were growing things like cassava root and, and another tribe, they were growing um, sorghum grain and um, their body fat was more saturated than was the Americans at the time. Hmm. And then fast forward to 1991, now the obesity epidemic is raging. And there's another study where they, um, they took adipose tissue samples there. And it's admittedly a slightly, this was, I think, postmenopausal women, which is a slightly different scenario. But, you know, their body fat compared to the Nigerian tribes or compared to Americans in 1962 had two things. One is lots more polyunsaturated fat, but also lots 
more um, monounsaturated fat in relation to their saturated fat. And so this turns out there's a thing called the desaturase index. And what it is is it compares um, – so oleic acid is the monounsaturated fat found largely in olive oil. Um, stearic acid is an 18-carbon saturated fat. It's called stearic acid because it comes from a steer, which is a male cow. Um, it's fairly prevalent in beef fat and in uh, cocoa butter and chocolate and other things. And, and so that, that stearic acid is um, – like I was saying in the beginning – when we make our own fat, first we make um, palmitic acid, which is a 16 carbon saturated fat. And there's an enzyme that can lengthen that to 18 carbons and that becomes stearic acid. And then there's another enzyme called SCD1. And SCD1 can actually remove one of those saturated bonds and make stearic acid into linoleic acid. And SCD1 is kind of a key regulator of the process of lipogenesis, which is to say making fat. And, and it turns out that in people with a high desaturase index, which is to say you don't have a lot of stearic acid, but you have lots of this oleic acid, um, which is to say that you're, you're making a lot of this enzyme, SCD1. People who make a lot of this SCD1 in America – there's lots of studies. Um, they have higher waist circumference. Um, they have higher, you know, waist to hip ratio. They're just simply more obese on it. The more of this SCD1 that you are producing, the more obese you will be. And that's, that's true right now in actual Americans and this, and, and Europe, not just mm -hmm. Americans, also in Europeans. And this has been repeatedly shown. There's lots of studies that show this. Um, I think that's a, pretty well proven at this point. Um, and so the question is why, why does this, um, you know, why is this enzyme such a big deal? Why does it matter? Right. Um, and so I was kind of, I was telling you this before, uh, I'm going to back up for a second and put this into again, an evolutionary context. Um, and so there's a bunch of mammals who can enter into hibernation. Um, right. And they're on all branches of the mammalian family tree. So for instance, most mammals have placentas, but if you look at very ancient mammals, such as a duck billed platypus, uh, there are also mammals who lay eggs. And in the middle, there are marsupials who are mammals that have a pouch rather than a placenta. Right. And so, but there are, um, there are egg laying mammals who are hibernators and there are marsupials that are hibernators and there are placental mammals such as bears that are hibernators. And so, so when you look at the mammalian family tree, it's strongly suggestive that the original animal that all mammals evolved from was able to hibernate, mm -hmm. um, I would argue. And so to hibernate, it turns out, you need to go into an alternative kind of metabolic state called torpor. Um, and that's just what they call it. And so, um, you know, and so what is so, okay, okay. Okay. So what's the goal of hibernating? Well, you, you need to be able to store fat, right? That's the whole point of, of getting ready for winter is you need to switch your metabolism over so that you're storing fat rather than burning it. And, and how, okay, so how does hibernation actually work? Well, um, a clever study was done, and this was, this has been known for a long time. This is, study was done, I think, in 92 or, and, you know, it's been done a long time ago where they took um, hibernating ground squirrels in the lab and they fed them different amounts of linoleic acid, which is the polyunsaturated fat um, found in soybean oil, found in lard if we feed them too much corn, right? Um, and so the squirrels who only got 1% of lin or one and a half percent of linoleic acid in their diet. Um, well, let's start with the ones who got more, the squirrels who got 8% of linoleic acid in their diet, uh, they took the food away and they turned down the temperature so that it, you know, to stimulate the oncoming of winter and those squirrels within days went into hibernation. They curled up, they went to sleep and, you know, 
They're fat. They're good. Yeah. They're good for the winter. They're nice and fat. They're happy. The animals who only got one and a half percent linoleic acid in their diet, the same thing when they took away the food and turned down the temperature, they failed to go into hibernation. And in fact, not only did they go, not only did they fail to go into hibernation, they burned off their entire winter store of fat in about nine days. So these, you know, so squirrels that were not given enough linoleic acid rapidly burned off all of their fat in, in response to fasting and cold instead of the ones who got enough linoleic acid, mm -hmm. i.e. polyunsaturated fat, i.e. vegetable oil. They were perfectly happy. They were like, great, let's hibernate. We're in torpor. We're happy, blah, blah, blah. They, so they, they hibernate and they, they, they hold on to their store of body fat, right? And so torpor is, is a metabolic state where we are we become very good at maintaining the amount of fat that we have and torpor as i've just explained and has been demonstrated lots of times it can be triggered by eating a lot of linoleic acid but in fact um it's really defined by the desaturase index what happens is and this is interesting so if you look at the literature you know, again, I'm talking about the enzyme SCD1 mm -hmm. um, that converts saturated fat to monounsaturated fat. And if you look at the literature, what the literature says is polyunsaturated fat suppresses SCD1. Uh, the literature says polyunsaturated fat will, will make you produce less SCD1 and actually your desaturase index will go down because you'll have more stearic acid and you'll have less oleic acid. And that's true up to a point. So again, if we go back to the Nigerian um, farming tribes, what you see is the Nigerians that were, that were um, living on the sorghum, which is a grain that's a little bit oily. It's kind of like corn. It's like f five or 6% of calories probably from linoleic acid. They actually had a tremendous amount of stearic acid. They have the, the highest amount of stearic acid stored in their body fat of anyone that I've ever seen because a little bit of linoleic acid does suppress SCD1 because the body wants a certain balance of saturation, right? Mm -hmm. It wants your fat to be like, eh, about this saturated. And so, so if you have a source of this polyunsaturated fat, you don't need to make any monounsaturated fat, right? So the body just turns that off. But... At some threshold value, if you eat too much linoleic acid, it actually cranks up your SCD1 tremendously. So you have this U-shaped curve where like a little bit of linoleic acid suppresses SCD1 activity. A lot of linoleic acid, it goes through the roof. And so that is torpor. Torpor is when you eat so much linoleic acid um, that you upregulate SCD1 and your saturated fat becomes very unsaturated. And if you look at obese Americans right now, what you see is you see high amounts of linoleic acid and high amounts of oleic acid together, and you see very small amounts of stearic acid. And all of these changes happened in America on average between 1960 and 1990. And like, there's plenty of evidence in the literature that this happened. Like, mm. Amer actual Americans in 1990 had far less stearic acid than did Americans in 1960 and far, far less than a Nigerian, you know, farming tribe in 1960. And so sometime between 1960 and 1990, the average American ate enough linoleic acid to upregulate SCD1. And we are now in, I, I think that we have all entered into a state of torpor, which, like I say, is probably shared with all mammals. And I'll throw one more really interesting anecdotal thing um, to, to, to support mm -hmm. that. I have a, another article on my blog is called Bear Hunting Season. Um, Native Americans in the U.S. made tremendous use of, they ate tons of bear fat. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of bears back then. And, and that was one of their, one of their staple foods was bear fat. Um, and this was true 
East Coast, West Coast, all over the all over the country. And bears, of course, have to hibernate. And so, I mean, obviously, the classic thing people think of grizzly bears eating salmon, right? And what are they doing? They're they're consuming a lot of polyunsaturated fat so they they can get into torpor and fatten up for winter. But on the not all bears have access to these great salmon rivers that you see in Alaska in the eastern U.S. They would have gotten there by eating acorns. Um, bears graze on acorns in the fall, and so so bears are fattest in the fall, right? They put on a tremendous amount of fat. You have these nice fat bears, um, and over the winter they burn off, you know, two thirds of their fat. And but the but the interestingly as they hibernate the polyunsaturated fat is burned off first it's preferentially burned off so so by the end of winter they have way less They're back to normal. than they had than they had in the fall yeah so the question is this when did native americans hunt bear did they do it in the fall when the animals were at their fattest and they would have had the best yield of fat or did they do it in the spring when the bears were much less fat but the fat was lower in polyunsaturated fat and the answer is almost universally they hunted them in the spring or in late winter. So they weren't, when they hunted bears, they weren't maximizing the yield of fat. They were, ma they were getting the fat when it had the minimum amount of polyunsaturated fat. And another thing that they did was they ate a lot of acorns, but they boiled off. They boiled the, the acorns for hours and waited for the acorn fat to float to the top, and they removed that. And then sometimes they would add bear fat back to the acorn meal. So it's not like they were against combining fat and acorn meal. They just didn't want the acorn fat. They wanted the bear fat from the spring, right? Yeah. So the, clearly they were very deliberate about which fats they ate and which fats they didn't. And, and everything suggests what they were trying to do is avoid the polyunsaturated fat because they probably realized if we eat too much polyunsaturated fat – we're cold in the winter, right? The U S is cold. If you're an Iroquois, like you got to get through winter in upstate New York. I live here. It's cold. Trust me. And it's like, you want your body fat. You want to, you want to have a high metabolic rate. You want your body temperature to be high so that you can get through the cold winter. And they probably knew that they needed the right fats this, to do that. That's so amazing. I want to know more about how they figured that out, but humans are amazing through trial and error. We've done such amazing things over the years and i mean that's like the whole weston price book it's like these all disparate peoples knew to eat certain foods and eat the organ meats and do this around pregnancy to have healthy kids so yeah humans are amazing and it, totally and it's they also didn't want to get fat i mean you're saying yes they could get cold with all the the poofas but maybe if they ate too much of it they would get too fat and they wouldn't be i don't know you can't be like a good hunter and a good get you know Native American, if you're running around too fat. <laughs> sure. Well, I'll throw one more fun anecdote. Um, uh, so there's an anecdote from the 1700s, and the guy says, you know, the other thing that that um, Native Americans in the Northeast ate a lot of was was maple sugar, and um, and the guy said, you know, some Native Americans were so fond of maple sugar that that was all that they ate. And those are the only fat Native Americans that I've seen. Mm. And what's interesting about that is um, the other thing that massively increases uh, SCD1 levels is sugar, and specifically eating mostly sugar. So if you take a lab mouse and you feed him like a diet that's like 90% sugar, their SCD one levels go up like tenfold. Mm. And so, you know, that's kind of like a, a unifying mechanism between like, okay, well, if you eat nothing but sugar, your SCD one levels shoot through the roof. And if you eat too much vegetable oils, your SCD one levels shoot through the roof. And SCD one levels are clearly associated with obesity and abdominal obesity. And so, you know, it all kind of it all, it all comes together, right? It all lines up. That's so great. And I love the U-shaped curve. It's always a U-shaped curve in nature in which sugar, I mean, I'm sure you agree that the sugar isn't the problem, but if you're talking about eating all sugar, then it's a huge problem. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah, so. exactly. Well, and, and then you think about, you know, kids who are like going through their old their whole day and all they're drinking is like 
Red Bull, you know, or these like energy sugar energy just, drinks. Yeah, so that's it's like whatever, yeah. 90% of their diet. And you're like, oh, your SED levels must be through the roof right now. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's not good. So, okay. So you're talking, I love this. We've got to kind of recap here. Humans back where we evolved from, our early ancestors had this hibernation mode. Right. And then, so now you humans don't hibernate, but you're connecting the, our ancestors to having, you know, our ancient ancestors of humans having this hibernation mode. And this topic has come up on the podcast a few times of we're, we're in this constant pre hibernation mode, right? This is our, our, our right. modern environment is everyone's just eating like we're going into hibernation mode. Everyone is getting fat. Everyone's eating the high poofas and the high sugars and everything at the same time. And we're getting fat, and it it makes sense. And we that we even talk about the lowering body body temperatures, which you which you can tell us about too. This kind of ties into the the pro metabolic idea of yes, you want to have a high metabolism. That's back what you're talking about in the old days in the 30s. We had a very high metabolism, right? We weren't fat. We were eating tons of calories, but we weren't fat because we weren't eating tons of poofas and tons of sugar. Probably, I mean, we didn't really have yeah, we didn't have the foods stuffed with tons of sugar back then either. So we were right. eating just the correct, uh, the correct fats, the correct protein, assumably, and you know, kind of correct amounts of foods, and we were we we're doing fine. Yeah, and so and so I'll, I'll take this back to okay. Um, I've been talking about SCD one a lot, and and why is that interesting? Well, so the way the way that SCD one kind of was thrust into the kind of public imagination. Well, not that. It's in the public imagination, but, but the way that it became interesting was, so even back in the forties, we had these mice and they're, they're called OB, OB mice and they became very fat. And so it was an interesting, this mouse that you grow in the lab and it would reliably become very fat. And, and they didn't know why until the mid nineties, they discovered that the mice can't make a, a protein called leptin. And so leptin is released by our fat cells. And essentially, the more, the more fat we get, the more leptin we release. It's more or less linearly correlated to the amount of fat we have, right? So it's like all fat is giving off this leptin. So the more fat you have, the more circulating leptin that you have. And so leptin is often, um, you know, if people have heard about leptin, they've typically heard something like, well, leptin... The, the, the job of leptin is to decrease food intake and to blunt your appetite, and it signals in the hypothalamus. And that's true, um, but that's only one of the many things that leptin does. The, uh, one of the other major things that leptin does is it suppresses SCD1. Um, and so what they, what they found, and where they, the way this got really interesting is they found out that if, so if they took a mouse that, you know, was this OB, OB mouse that couldn't create functional leptin, and if they deleted its SCD1 gene, right? So now it can't, the fat mouse can no longer desaturate its own body fat. What happens? The mice get a, an incredibly high um, metabolic rate, and they get lean, despite the fact that they're massively overeating. Like, so, th so because they have leptin, they still overeat. They still eat all the time. But since their body fat can't get unsaturated, their metabolic rate shoots through the roof because unsaturated fat lowers your metabolic rate. Um, and so, so, the, so it, what the leptin is doing, and, and so insulin increases... SCD1 and leptin lowers it. And so what you see is insulin and leptin are sort of in this battle over this enzyme SCD1. And SCD1 is a key um, modulator of your metabolic rate. Um, and so you see that these, you know, and one of the things, like you say, the, the mice who don't make leptin, they have low body temperatures. And once you either give them enough leptin or just simply remove the SCD1, their body temperature goes back to normal, right? They start, they start uh, having a normal body temperature again. And so, so that's how this SCD1 kind of jumped into the thing. You're like, oh, it turns out that mostly what leptin does is it, 
is it knocks down this SCD one. And there's one other thing that leptin does, which is it um it increases the amount of a protein called CPT one. Um, and what that enzyme does is it controls the rate that fat can enter your mitochondria. Um, and so if someone is properly responding to leptin, they have very saturated body fat and they have a fat, a fast rate of fat metabolism going into the mitochondria. And so those two factors together, essentially, if you have very, very saturated fat and it's going into your mitochondria quickly, you're going to have a high rate of metabolism. What that does is it creates, um, it creates reactive oxygen species. And, and if you look at my blog, a lot of it is about reactive oxygen species and how they're produced in the mitochondria. But if you can produce a lot of reactive oxygen species in your mitochondria, um, what happens is your mitochondria produces these uncoupling proteins and the uncoupling proteins basically allow you to do quote thermogenesis, which just means making heat, which essentially means you wind up burning off a lot of calories as heat rather than, um, you know, storing it as fat. Right. So, and well, tell us why that's good. Cause most people know of ROS as a bad thing. Right. Well, so ROS are a key signal. Um, and if we take a step back again, okay. So, so back in the day, the first life did not have a mitochondria. Um, we're mammals, we have lots of mitochondria. And what happens in a mitochondria is we have this thing called a an electron transport chain. And it's pretty complicated the way it works. But in a nutshell, um, here's my 10,000 feet overview of how oxidative life works, is that um, when light hits a leaf in a plant, um, oxygen is a very uh, electrophilic molecule, which means it likes to hold on to electrons. Oxygen is like the second most, the second most electrophilic uh, atom in the world, other than lithium. And what do we make batteries out of? We make them out of lithium because you have this big electro potential difference. So oxygen and lithium are the two things in the world that love to take electrons. And so what chlorophyll is doing is it's literally using the energy of the sun to strip electrons away from oxygen. And it's taking the hydrogens and carbons from H2O and CO2, and it's forcing oxygen to share electrons with itself as O2 in the air, which it doesn't really like to do. And it's taking those hydrogens and carbons and it's building them into things like fat and starch, which are essentially hydrocarbons, right? And then in our mitochondria, we allow the these electrons to flow back to the oxygen and so the things like fat which are mostly hydrogen and carbon are now um going back to being h2o and co2 so now you know oxygen can basically just steal all of the electrons from hydrogen and steal all the electrons from carbon it holds them much more strongly than they do so the oxygen is really happy when it's h2o or it's co2 it's less happy when it's O2. And, um, and so essentially, yeah, the plants are stripping the electrons away uh, from oxygen. And in our mitochondria, the electrons flow back. And they do so through this thing called the electron transport chain. And basically, the electrons bounce from one protein complex to the next, to the next, to the next. And, and every time they do that, the a, a proton is pumped outside of the mitochondria and what ends up happening is mitochondria is like a little battery it has a positive charge on the outside and it has a negative charge on the inside and it's it's generating that voltage difference using the energy stored in these hydrocarbon bonds by letting that electron flow back to oxygen which is the sort of most lowest energy state is, is the H2O and the CO2. Um, and so that's what's happening on a macro picture. The, the mitochondria is using this energy and the food that we eat to set up this voltage difference. Um, and one of the inevitable consequences, it turns out, so this is all very complicated and these electrons are moving on. And um, 
inevitably in this process, some of the electrons basically bounce back out of this electron transport chain. Um, and it's easy to overwhelm it. Like there's all these, there's all these different players and everything has to be kind of like lined up right for the electron to make it all the way through and form water. And when they come back out the wrong, uh, the wrong end, basically, that is when we create reactive oxygen species. And the first thing created is something called superoxide, which is a fairly reactive, but not extraordinarily dangerous reactive molecule. Um, and that is fairly rapidly converted to hydrogen peroxide by um, something called superoxide dismutase, um, which is a fancy name, but it doesn't really matter. Hydrogen peroxide is 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 cool and interesting molecule because and and you know it's literally the exact same molecule that you buy in like the brown bottle at the drugstore mm -hmm. that you pour on wounds. Um, and what's interesting about hydrogen peroxide is it is an oxidant. Um, it does want to take electrons. Um, and, but it's a small neutral molecule. So superoxide is, has a negative charge and it won't flow through a membrane. So membranes are made of fat and fat is a neutral com. It's a, well, if you've ever, you know, anyone who's been around realizes that fat and water don't like to mix. Mm -hmm. Right. And the things that are soluble in fat are not necessarily soluble in water. And, Hydrogen peroxide is interesting because it's a small molecule and it's actually soluble in water, but it's also soluble in fat. And so what it can do is when hydrogen peroxide is produced in the mitochondria, it can actually diffuse right through the mitochondrial membrane outside of the membrane. So, so that's cool. So one can imagine this ancient organism that had figured out how to make this electron transport. So the benefit of an electron transport chain is so we can take in glucose and without using any oxygen, we can go through a process called glycolysis. And that gives us some small number of ATP molecules, which are ATP is the molecule we actually use to like move our muscles around and do most of the work that, that our body does. Um, and so the mitochondria is really converting this hydrocarbon energy into ATP. And um, uh Blah blah blah. We use glucose, but it, it so right glucose. So we can we can do a process called glycolysis. We get like I think it's four ATP out of a molecule of glucose, and that's all we get. But if we have an electron transport chain, and we can set up that voltage differential, all of a sudden, out of that same molecule of glucose, we can get like twenty four molecules of ATP or twenty. I forget the exact number, but it's a lot more, right? We get a lot more energy out of a molecule of glucose if we can do electron transport, and so. Somewhere in life, some clever little creature evolved to have an electron transport chain. And it was like, oh, sweet. I'm, I'm winning here. I can, you know, I'm, I'm, I've got this electron transport chain and I can, um, you know, and I'm getting all this extra ATP. Um, and it was probably also producing a lot of these reactive oxygen species. Um, and it had, and it would have had uh, superoxide dismutase. And so it would have been converting all of that superoxide it was producing into hydrogen peroxide and the hydrogen peroxide would have been diffusing out of it into like the ocean, right? So it's making this waste product, but it doesn't care because it's just the hydrogen peroxide is just diffusing out mm -hmm. and it's going to the ocean and, and life is good, right? And so, so then the next thing that happens is another cell which doesn't have an electron transport chain, some amoeba-like cell basically engulfs the other cell that has the electron transport chain. And so that's the moment at which, um, that's the moment at which we became these kind of like, now we have a mitochondria because that thing with the electron transport chain became the mitochondria. It came to live inside of this other cell as its mitochondria. And so now you have this bigger cell and it kind of owns this other little cell. Mm -hmm. And so now it can, ta-da, do electron transport. And so now this bigger cell that's an engulf, the other cell is much more efficient at using things like glucose and also more efficient at using fat. It's getting lots more ATP. So it's happy, but it has this problem because the thing that it engulfed is still releasing all of this hydrogen peroxide, right? And it turns out that, and the other thing is that the, the cell that contains the mitochondria needs a way to communicate with it. Like it needs to know what the mitochondria is doing at any given moment. It's like, well, 
what is what's the mitochondria doing? Is it burning sugar? Is it burning fat? Is it are we you know are we energy rich? Are we energy poor? And it and the nucleus of that cell is going to produce different genes in different contexts based on what the mitochondria is doing, right? And if the mitochondria is burning fat, it turns out if it's burning saturated fat, it makes way more reactive oxygen species than if it's burning glucose. Um, and it also is going to make way more reactive oxygen species than if it's burning polyunsaturated fat. And so the cell is using the hydrogen peroxide as a signal. It's, that's how the cell knows what the mitochondria is doing by how much hydrogen peroxide it's producing. So on a very, you know, deep evolutionary level, every um, cell that has a nucleus, which is say every one of our cells is programmed to use um, hydrogen peroxide as the, the switch, the sensor. That's how it knows what its mitochondria are doing is based on how much hydrogen peroxide they're, they're creating. Um, that's how it knows if energy is plentiful. That's how it knows a lot of different things. And so, so yeah, so hydrogen peroxide is a really crucial signal. And it's also interesting in other ways because it's, like I say, it is an oxidant, but it's not a super potent one. And there's actually a whole family of, of, um, proteins that we have that they say are quote redox sensitive. And that, what that means is they have a, a, a one of their amino acids has a molecule of cysteine and cysteine is it's kind of like a metal and it has a bunch of different redox states and, and enzymes can be turned on or turned off based on the amount of peroxide in the cell. And peroxide is not a strong enough oxidant to make things like lipid peroxides and things that do like real damage to our proteins and our DNA and our fats. So, Hydrogen peroxide can actually build up to a certain degree in a cell and it can, it can turn on or off all of these enzymes and transcription factors that are redox sensitive. And it can do all of this without leading to the runaway chain of events that we associate with real true oxidative stress and cellular damage and protein damage and fat damage and all that stuff. So you know, and that's what makes hydrogen peroxide such an interesting and important part of our biology is it, is it is, you know, it's, it's really good. We can, we can respond to changes in hydrogen peroxide really well, and we can do it all while avoiding serious damage to the cell. Mm. Um, I'm slightly regretting asking that question, but uh, <laughs> I hope people are still with us. So, but but go back. So most people know reactive oxygen species as being a bad thing, and you're saying that that burning fat and saturated fat, especially, you get more of them. Right. That is absolutely true. And so yes. And so it turns out that um, and this is and this is all I got on this whole journey from reading the blog Hyperlipid um, Peter, by yeah. this guy Peter and. Um, it's a great blog, but it's, it's real dense and real hard to understand. So I called my initial blog uh, a, a layperson's guide to hyperlipid back when I wrote the ROS theory of obesity. And one of the interesting things that happens in response to this hydrogen uh, peroxide generation is it, is it cuts off insulin signaling. And so if insulin is a signal to um, store more energy. Mm -hmm. Insulin is a signal that says energy is plentiful. We should be storing energy. And like I say, it's kind of battling it out with leptin, right? Leptin and insulin are at odds. Leptin is saying we should be increasing our metabolic rate, burning more energy. Insulin is saying we should be slowing our metabolic rate, storing energy, burning less energy. And when insulin signals, it passes that signal to a bunch of different molecules. And, and those molecules are redox sensitive and they're turned off by the hydrogen peroxide. So if we can generate a lot of hydrogen peroxide in our mitochondria, we can actually shut off insulin signaling. Um, and so, you know, my argument is that one of the issues that we've had is by eating all these polyunsaturated fats, and then that overwhelms um, SCD1. And so now all of our saturated fat, like stearic acid is getting converted into oleic acid. Now it's like, okay, we start burning fat and the biologically appropriate response 
to burning fat is um, one, we start generating a lot of reactive oxygen species. And what that does is it shuts off insulin signaling and it puts us into this kind of like fat burning mode. And now um, reactive, if you make a lot of reactive oxygen species, they actually shut off SCD1 production. And so leptin, probably what leptin does is by suppressing SCD1 and by um, increasing CPT1, which again, that controls how fast fat can enter in the mitochondria. So if you have a lot of fat being shuttled in the mitochondria and it's very saturated, you're going to make a lot of reactive oxygen species. And so I think leptin does its job of increasing our metabolic rate basically by increasing reactive oxygen species production in the mitochondria in, a, in an appropriate way. And, and what all that does is then it creates um, with these uncoupling proteins, and this takes us back to I think your initial question is, what these uncoupling proteins do is they allow that, um, I said the mitochondria was like a battery and there's that voltage across. Mm -hmm. When we make these uncoupling proteins, it's like short-circuiting a battery. It just gives off a tremendous amount of heat and now we're just burning off calories as as heat rather than storing it as as fat and so all of these all these processes kind of work together i would argue that leptin does its thing via production of reactive oxygen species in the mitochondria by one making our fat more saturated and two increasing the rate that it's entering the mitochondria um at the end of the day i think that's what leptin does mm. All right, so we'll try to recap. So you want a faster metabolism. You don't want to store fat. We'll, we'll, right. You don't want to store fat. A lot of Americans store too much fat since we've changed our diets. You want to have a high metabolism. You want to have a, a normal body temperature. And a lot of yeah people have a low body temperature and a sort of, quote, slow metabolism. So you're saying that by eating the correct foods and the correct fats – and that can include starches and includes, yeah, saturated fats that we can make our mitochondria work better in a sense or have more more energy production and and have a higher metabolism. Yeah, and what I, what I will say though, however, is what's unclear about all this is like, all right, so we know that, we know how to get into torpor. We can get into torpor by eating a bunch of vegetable oil and then our SCD1 gets dysregulated and we make too much and our fat gets real unsaturated. What's less clear is how we get out of it. And so I would say that, yes, starch is a good food for a human who is metabolically healthy, but I think it's less clear. And I think this is one of the reasons why ketogenic diets have helped so many people once you're in this state of torpor and your SCD1 is dysregulated, you know, the problem is you can no longer generate those reactive oxygen species in the mitochondria. And it's the reactive oxygen species at the end of the day, which are doing things like suppressing SCD1 and increasing your metabolic rate. So once your fat gets too unsaturated, you can no longer set into motion this whole cycle of reactive oxygen species production and uncoupling and thermogenesis and burning off calories. So the problem becomes now, once you're torpid, um, if you eat a bunch of starch, it's less clear if that's going to work out for you. And, and, it, and it becomes this self-regulating thing. The other, the other problem is that a lot of this is controlled by um, another thing called PPAR gamma, and I'm not going to linger on it other than to say that the end products of lipogenesis and SCD, which means making fat, and the end products of SCD1 upregulate the transcription factor, which upregulates the SCD1. So once you get into this cycle of torpor, it's like self, mm. it becomes self <laughs> defeating. You know, no. it's like it becomes self propelling. It's like, oh, the end products of scd1 increase the amount of scd1 and so now you're stuck you're in this like positive feedback loop mm -hmm. of of you just stay in this mode because you're you can never get your body fat saturated again once once it's out of control um 
And so that's, so that's the problem. So on my blog, I'm talking about like, how do we get out of this? Once we're in it, what do we do? You know, and I don't know the answer yet. Um, I'm, I'm, I've had this weird oil imported, uh, called Sterculia oil. And it actually has a, um, the main fat in it has a, a, a ring structure. So it's, it's kind of like a saturated fat, but it has this ring structure and, and that's right where the mechanism of action of SCD1 would, would be desaturating, but it can't get in there and do it because there's a ring structure in place. And so that actually inhibits the enzyme. So that's one of the things, um, that's one of the things that I'm, that I'm trying to see if I can sort of get my, you know, and, and how are you going to do that? How are you that experiment? Well, well, so, so yeah, so that's a good question. And so what I did was, so there's a test, um, by a company called MegaQuant that I've been, that I've been, um, recommending. And so you take a little spot of blood and you send it to them and they can give you back, um, the composition of all of your, the, the fat composition of the phospholipids in your blood. And so that gives you like stearic acid and oleic acid, um, among other things. And so you can actually, using that, you can calculate your desaturase index. And so for me, that's like a key, in, it's, it's, it's an indirect indicator of SCD1 activity because you could also just eat a lot of like olive oil and you'll probably have more oleic acid. But if, if you're not eat like I don't, I haven't been eating olive oil. I've been recommending people to avoid, uh, to avoid nuts and olive oil and vegetable oils and eat more stearic acid. Right. Mm -hmm. That's been my thing to try to like get back to where we were. Right. But, um, but you can test it through tests like that and you can, you can calculate your desaturase index, which again is just oleic acid divided by stearic acid. And so, um, the, what I found is when you look at traditional populations like, um, old school America, old school France, and some other populations that I have on my blog, there's a post called the membrane phospholipids of different populations or something like that. They would typically have a desaturase index of around one to one. So they would have in, you know, in this specific subset of fats, which this test is testing, um, they would have roughly the same amount of stearic acid and oleic acid. Mm -hmm. When I did the test, my number was like 2.1. So I have more than twice as much oleic acid as I had of stearic mm -hmm. acid when I started. And so I found that after, you know, by taking a few hundred milligrams of this oil a day, um, that number starts to steadily change. Like I start having more stearic acid and I start having less oleic acid. Mm -hmm. So you can really see the change in, in your, um, red blood cells. One of the, pro well, a problem with that is I think the situation in your red blood cell membranes is a lot more fluid than your stored adipose tissue. So one thing I did was I took a bunch of it and I watched, that ratio changed. In fact, I got, I got down to a ratio of like 0.65 where I had more stearic acid than I had mm -hmm. of oleic acid, which was, um, and that only took eight weeks or something of taking like a teaspoon of the oil a day, which is a lot. And I wouldn't take that much, but, um, I was just seeing what would happen. And then I stopped taking it for six weeks to see what would happen. And unfortunately my ratio after I stopped taking it for six weeks went right back down to what it almost mm. was, because I think it's, I think, you know, it's going to work off of your stored body fat. I think in the long term, the desaturase index of your red blood cell membranes is going to be based on your stored body fat. In the short term, it's easy to manipulate. So now I just think it's going to be a longer term process of kind of like getting rid of all my stored, all these long chain monounsaturated fats that I've been making probably my entire life because, you know, I was chubby as a kid too. Um, and so, yeah. And so I don't know. I, I don't know. Ultimately, like, will, like, can you, can you get out of torpor by ultimately by changing the composition of your stored body fat? I think so. I think in theory you can, but, uh, you know, I haven't proved it yet. A lot of people are trying, a lot of people are trying yeah. it and thinking about it, but it's, so it's a long-term question. We don't know. Maybe. Well, what, did, what was the difference when you were down to 0.6? Did you feel any difference? Did you lose weight? Um, well, <laughs> I, unfortunately I did this experiment in the, 
in the late fall and into winter and it was like the end of covid and so it was during like thanksgiving and i went uh, to christmas at my family so there was yeah. like also a lot of feasting happening at the same time so it was a really poorly controlled experiment in that sense and no i didn't lose weight but it was also the holidays where i always you know gain 10 pounds of the holidays so it's uh you know uh, remains to be seen and, and and nor am i sure that you know because i could see it in in the membrane phospholipids i'm not sure yet that that was reflected all the way down into you know like the triglycerides which are ultimately that's the fat going into the mitochondria so i wish i had a test that i could measure that same thing in like triglycerides and in my um free fatty acids mm -hmm. also called non-esterified fatty acids because at the end of the day those are the fats being shuttled straight into your mitochondria and and those are composed of a mixture of your stored body fat and like your recent dietary fat yeah right and so that's kind of the the two main factors controlling how saturated is the fat actually entering your mitochondria and as of yet i don't have an easy way to measure those things, but I would love one. So if anyone has any ideas, let me know. Interesting. <laughs> well, at least we know how to get out torpor. It's just to stop eating the processed foods and the seed oils. At least that seems to help people. It's definitely step one yeah. for sure. Yeah. You if can... you're still if you're still stuck in it, then you may have to get more creative. But that's definitely step one. Well, yes. And then we're talking about troubleshooting, kind of in the beginning. That well, maybe you can it, tell your own story it, of of just losing weight or your weight story in general, but sure. Like and I will people, say, well, I want to say specifically is some people can do keto diets and it uh, on the outside seems like it's great, but they're eating tons of poofa still without realizing it. They could be eating. Yeah. They're getting like salads with salad dressing and then it's just seed oil or they're eating tons of pork and chicken and it's conventionally raised and they're getting tons of poofas and they see stalls. So, right. Right. Yeah. And I, and I will say, um, so, if you go to fire in a bottle and check out an article called David's story under testimonials, this guy was like, he legitimately did um, what I call the croissant diet to a T in the sense of he, so he got rid of all of the, all the polyunsat, all the sources that he knew about of polyunsaturated fat in his diet, as well as eliminated nuts and olive oil. And, you know, he was in his fifties, um, not, not super obese or anything, but definitely had abdominal fat and he read my blog and he started, um, he started, he shifted over and, and he did really detailed tracking. Like he, he, uh, he had an app that it was tracking everything he, he mm -hmm. ate. And in the beginning he was eating like 4,500 calories a day of things like haagen And he was all, he was supplementing with stearic acid, um, and he got he got some of the the supplemental stearic acid powder off my website and he was using that in different ways and he was eating like huge amounts of food and he was eating you know 4500 calories a day first and he dropped off over time to where it was like more like 3000 calories a day but he just got shredded mm. you know just literally by eliminating the pufa and by just focusing on eating lots of saturated fat and lots of stearic acid it you know it for him he was in a metabolic state where it worked like exactly like i predict it should work right in theory it hasn't worked nearly as i mean it has worked for me not nearly as well as it has for david so he's like at this point he's the poster child of like you know he didn't reduce calories in fact he increased calories and he sort of like gleefully increased his calories because it was working and it still continued to work despite the fact that he was like chowing down on haagen -Dazs and all this stuff <laughs> so oh. he's, there's a couple he actually has like his full day dietary reports on the site and you can look at those and and he responds in the comments so you know if you leave him comments he'll respond to them and stuff so so he's really been that's like a the the classic case yeah. right now like yeah this really worked for this guy for whatever like the you know so i think it can work i have still like i say i still have a very high desaturase index but i did so what i did at first was um i was reading about these mice um that originally i saw on high on blog hyperlipid and i talk about in the arwis theory of obesity where um you know they were this researcher she was doing her um her master's thesis and um she fed different groups of mice a different diet and and i should have looked at that before we did this but um some of them were getting 
uh, basically like mostly starch in their diet and then 40% of calories as fat. And all of the fat was stearic acid. And so some of the mice given, I don't remember what they were given exactly, given like vegetable oil, let's say, they got really obese. But the mice given the stearic acid got lean. Like they got like six pack abs kind of lean, you know, like super lean. And I was like, and I was like, wow, that's really interesting. And, and so I was looking at the composition of the diet and I'm like, oh, it's like 40% saturated fat and the rest is mostly starch and it's sugar. And I was like, that to me sounds like a croissant recipe basically. Mm -hmm. Right. Cause I, you know, I've gone to French Culinary Institute and I'm like, yeah, flour and butter. And the other thing that I've always noticed is that like French people and traditional Americans eat butter and flour and potatoes and they stay very lean. And so when I had that kind of eureka moment, that's when I put it all together. And I was like, oh, I could make croissants, you know, based on what she was giving to these mice and I should be able to lose weight. And I did it. And it was like, um, and so what I did was I bought some stearic acid and I started like adding all of this stearic acid to the croissants and, and I did, I lost like, you know, I lost like four inches off my waist in about a month. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, 17 or 18 pounds, something like that. Right. You know, right off the bat. Um, and so I was like, okay, I think there's something to this. <laughs> um, and that's when I published the croissant diet. And, and I think that, you know, Okay, so what's happening there? Well, I think that, like I say, most of us, when you look at our stored body fat, we're really low in stearic acid. We have like 2 or 3%. So if in your diet, all of a sudden, you start eating a bunch of stearic acid, the kind of like blend of fats going into your mitochondria is like going to change right away. Um, and, and so, and there's, a, there's another study that people love um, that's also in the ROS theory of obesity where that I, I called the banana milkshake study. Um, the the a research team, they, they took people and they put them on a, a low fat vegan diet for I think two days. And then they gave them a milkshake that, that had like 25 grams of, of pure stearic acid in it. And what they showed was that um, the people on the low fat vegan diet, their mitochondria actually fragment and they, you know, we think of mitochondria as these little ovals, but, but they're not, they're kind of these long things and they can build into these like branched networks. And after the low fat vegan diet, the, um, the mitochondria were all separated. Um, and after the 25 grams of stearic acid within like six hours, their mitochondria actually all fuse together and make these branch networks. And it's a beautiful paper because they, they did this staining of the, mm -hmm. of the mitochondria in this electron, uh, electron microscope. Uh, so you can really, you can really, it's very visual, right? You can see these mm -hmm. networks of mitochondria being formed. And they did another analysis showing that in fact, um, in response to the stearic acid, people were burning a lot more fat. Um, and so there were, they had, the, they showed this very, you know, short-term effect in real living Americans today showing that, yes, if you eat a bunch of stearic acid, your rate of fat burning increases within hours. So then so um, you're saying that them grouping together and bonding together is a good thing that helped them burn more fat and become more metabolically active. Yes, exactly. First, I don't, I don't know why they fuse when they burn fat, mm -hmm. but it seems like that's what they do. And, and so, um, and so, yeah, like I said, they did a secondary analysis arguing that, yes, the rate of fat burning was actually increased by mm -hmm. this fusion. And so it's like, you know, so when I see the lean mice eating starch and stearic acid with no body fat, and then, you know, you read the banana milkshake paper and you go, okay, something about the stearic acid is, is indeed enhancing um, metabolic rate, causing us to burn more fat, um, et cetera. And then that's, you know, and then that begins to square with my mm -hmm. well, this knowledge is. of French cuisine and traditional American foods and these guys in 1940 eating 5,000 calories a day and staying lean, you know, it all kind of, it, it all comes, comes together. together. Well, that, that's why it's not a French paradox, right? People talk about the French paradox and they're like, oh, how come they eat saturated fat and be healthy? Well, well, it's like saturated fat is healthy. <laughs> so yeah, ex but, exactly. And also, this is kind of one of these unifying theories I love 
I, you know, I talked to Dr. Kate Shannon and Dr. Goodrich, you know, multiple times about this stuff. And right. you can look at all these different healthy populations around the world. And you're kind of mentioning them like the old school Americans or the French, or you can talk about, you know, the Japanese or any other cultures, they are eating starch, but it's fine because they're not eating the high poofas with it. And so they, right. if you have saturated fat and starch, and it seems like you could have any ratio of that, right? If you have any kind of, yeah. I'm sure there's maybe some ideal ratio, but you can look at all the healthy populations throughout time and they're eating some ratio of saturated fats, you know, and mono, mono, but just not a lot of PUFA and starches or fruits or something, right? You know, they were eating yep. like rice or they're eating tubers. Yeah, and I mean, if, if, you, if you look at a lot of the blue zone cultures, right, that they talk about, and I haven't spent a lot of time looking at them, but, but they're also more cultures that eat a lot of starch and they're very long lived and they seem very healthy. And you're like, okay, well that, you know, and so then, right. And then you look at pre steam right. oils. They, they're very, well, this is another thing that I want to make sure I understood because sometimes it seems there are cultures modern day that eat like low saturated fat and s s assumably higher or PUFA, but do seem to be doing okay. And I wanted to figure out how that would work. If that pokes holes in things, right. There's, you know, well, what's what's a good example of that? Well, I don't know. Maybe the Loma Linda type people, like these these people that are like vegetarians and they, you know, boast a, a high longevity. But I mean, you also can show. I love the one where you talk about the Mormons that don't have the the vegan the sort of vegetarian preference and live just as long. So it's all the other high, healthy lifestyle factors that they're doing, right? They don't yeah. drink, they don't smoke. But I'm just wondering, I just wanted to try to poke holes in this just to make sure we covered all sides is, is there these sort of healthy vegetarian type people that, or maybe are they just not eating that many poofas actually? They're the healthy, the ones that actually are healthy because I see so many unhealthy vegetarians. You know, there's always these people that sure. are like bragging. They're like, I'm 65. I've been eating vegetarian my whole life. And I'm like, yeah, you're overweight and you're not healthy at all. Like I can see you. But, right, yeah. But are there healthy ones maybe just not eating tons of steel? You know, I, I think that, yeah, I mean, I suspect so. I suspect that most people on a, if they're eating a quote-unquote healthy vegetarian diet are probably not, um, you know, they're probably not – drowning their foods in soybean oil i i hope well, I maybe i'm wrong about that anyway so maybe they would use vegetable if, oil, they're lo if they're low fat they then you're not eating it. a lot of oil in general yeah. or if you're just using small and like i say small amounts of 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 very small amounts of poofa might actually even be beneficial in terms of it's it's helping to suppress scd1 and keep that in check in very small amounts if you're healthy in the first place right um and so I think it's, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not shocked that, I mean, whatever. I mean, the China health study, like I say, that I talk about a lot, like they're eating almost all starch and they certainly metabolically they're healthy. Um, they might have all kinds of other health problems, but, but, you know, I, I'm focusing mostly on metabolic health, uh, but you know, they get uh, stomach cancer for instance. Oh, yeah. That's a problem, well, you, but I don't, I don't think much about that. Well, you know what I was <laughs> thinking about? Well, it's the, these populations that manage to stay somewhat lean. I know there are problems with people who are, especially currently in Asia, like India and China, where there's people who are lean but have massive problems and strokes and type 2 diabetes. Right. So it's and, and, and if you look around the world, all of those countries have seen a huge rise in vegetable oil consumption. Oh, yeah. You know, and, and so that's – and so what you're – yeah, what you see around the world is like, okay, well, they start eating more vegetable oil, and then that's when you start it goes bad. fat. And well, I was gonna say it's not necessarily about being overweight because you, you, but then most people, maybe aside from Asia, are overweight. So maybe there are some healthy people who manage to not overeat. This is like kind of my by force theory, where there's some people who just do it by force, and I know a lot of these girls, especially in LA, where they're just always sure. hungry. And right, you can, right, sure. By force, purely, purely through willpower. Through willpower, you so it's maybe, possible. Yes, I mean some of these populations they can eat pufas and you know, sort of vegetarian style diets, but by force remain lean, and then maybe you can remain pretty healthy. But most people just can't do that, and they're overweight. We know all the statistics about how many people are overweight, so that de facto they're not 
they're eating too much, right? They're they're doing something right. wrong, and they have so that when you have the tons of poofas and you're eating too much, then that's when the real problems occur. And well, talk about satiety. This kind of leads into satiety, right? This is something that I love, and we're saying, well, why do people eat too much, right? We know that somehow they ate too many calories, and we know that maybe you can you can eat quote too many calories and be fine, right? So it matters more right. about what these calories are and how your metabolism so, works. So I, it's funny. I was actually looking at, um, and, and I, I touch on this again in the ROS theory of obesity. So one of the things that's, that signals satiety is, guess what? ROS production in the hypothalamus. So one of the reasons that you might be eating past your point of, of what should be satiety, and this has always been a problem for me, is like overeating. Like I can my whole life I can easily eat. Like I can just keep eating. Mm -hmm. I'm the guy who like fills his plate up four times. And like, I literally just stop eating. Cause like my stomach hurts. It's not that I've, it's not that I'm experiencing any kind of like chemical. Like satiety done, signal. Yeah. I just like, I'm literally physically uncomfortable. I don't want to stuff anything else in me. Right. That's always been a problem that I've had. And so anyways, I was looking at this mouse study just like, I don't know, like two days ago. And, and it was mice who had, um, who, who weren't making leptin, uh, they couldn't make leptin, and they, they started um, giving them leptin injections, right? Mm -hmm. And what happened is at first, the mice dramatically reduced their, um, their caloric intake. They ate way less, right? And they started to lose body fat. And their body fat receded rapidly in response to the leptin. And then once their body fat uh, hit a certain low level, their consumption of calories just ramped up dramatically because now the leptin was in charge and they had healthy metabolisms and now they had high metabolic rates. And so they started eating more and more and more. So it's like their, um, you know, their satiety was matching their level of body fat, right? When they were fat, and they were getting leptin, they stopped eating. But as soon as they got lean, they started eating, even though they were getting injected with this uh, external leptin. And so I think that's like where you see that it's like, okay, yes, leptin is a, um, it's a huge mediator of satiety, but it, it's act, it's not acting on its own. You know, your hypothalamus is acting, yes, in response to leptin, but it's also looking at you know, other circulating levels of, you know, blood glucose and free fatty acids and all of this stuff. Um, there's one really good art. There's another um, article on my website that I talk about. I think it's called, um, it's like the level of energy in your body eight hours after a meal or something like that. But uh, there's a good study they did in Spain and they gave people, um, they gave people a meal of starch and butter versus a meal of like starch and vegetable oil. And what happens is, um, I kind of mentioned already, but free fatty acids are when your when your fat cells are sort of feeding your body, they do something called lipolysis, and so that's when they're releasing energy to the rest of the body. And that and that when they release the fat, it's called free fatty acids or non-esterified fatty acids, and those are what is floating in your bloodstream that is there for your other cell, like your fat cells, or sorry, your muscle cells they can take in that fat and burn it, right? Um, and so that's actually literally how you lose fat is your fat cells do this lipolysis and other tissues burn the fat. And so what they showed was that uh, if someone was given starch and butter, um, so one of the things that, that insulin does is it stops lipolysis from happening. So again, when I was talking about the ROS um, from saturated fat, blocking insulin signaling this is how it really works in the real life so if you eat starch and vegetable oil your fat cells in response to insulin stop releasing fat for the rest of your body to burn um and because you're very insulin sensitive and so at so maybe four hours after the meal now you're um you know you've burned off the the glucose from the meal and your fat cells are still not releasing fat to the rest of the body. But if you ate the butter four hours after the meal, 
uh, your levels of free fatty acids have actually returned to baseline. So it's like in response to a saturated fat meal, the amount of circulating fuel in your blood rebounds a lot faster to baseline than if it does if you eat unsaturated fats. And so that mm. might be the reason why, you know, if I eat, you know, whatever, bread and soybean oil, I'm hungry in three hours. If I ate bread and butter or bread and cocoa butter, for instance, which is really high in stearic acid. And some people, you know, after reading the croissant diet, have had good results with like putting cocoa butter in their coffee because it's high in stearic acid. And I think that affects satiety. And so, you know, it's like, okay, so four hours after a meal, if I eat a lot of saturated fat, I, I'm not hungry again mm -hmm. because my fat cells have not responded as dramatically to insulin because of the ROS production. And so they're, they're continuing to do lipolysis. They're essentially continuing to feed the rest of the body. But if you eat starch with vegetable oil, they just shut off because they're responding to insulin. Insulin says, don't release any more fat. This is super important. Uh, we got to this an hour and a half in, <laughs> but this is, uh, I really hope people are still here. I guess if you can't hear me, you're not here anyway. So you, this is really important because it's a little bit counterintuitive because people know they want to be insulin sensitive. Uh, patholo you know, pathologically, like your body, you want to be insulin sensitive, right? We know that people who are type 2 diabetic are not insulin sensitive and they have the problems and you want to be sensitive. But you're saying on a cellular level, you, you don't want that or you do want to be insulin sensitive. Um, or so, sorry, I, I, I am confusing people. You don't every, want that because every, then you don't have energy. So yeah, right. So, every cell, every cell chooses its own level of insulin sensitivity. So when I started to think, learn more about how fatty acids work in our body, it made more sense. So not everyone knows just how it even works. People just like, oh, you just eat fat and then like you get fat. No, it's like your, your cells, your adipose tissue, it's, there's this constant ebb and flow of fat going in and out of the cells. Right. So that, so that it's all, it's all very dynamic. Yeah. And that's what you, you explained and you, you want that to work correctly and you can, an insulin kind of controls that process. And you're basically saying that it, it's not when you're eating the poofas, it screws up that process and then your, your cells or adipose tissue can't do that properly. So then you have this lack of energy and this is, yeah, this is this back to the satiety thing is people, you want to be full for multiple hours at a time. You want to be full for the amount of food you ate, right? I was right. trying to make graphics right. on Instagram about that your satiety should match its calories. If you're eating the correct foods, your satiety does match your calories. So if I eat a big old steak and you know it has all these saturated fats, then I'm full for the right amount of time. So when I eat again, it's it's good. But you're talking about if you eat the wrong foods, you're not full for the correct amount of time because you're disrupting this this flow of your energy and your free fatty acid flow. So then you're going to eat again. And then people, that's why you're gaining weight. Right, right, right. And then, and then the only thing, and then what I would add to that is that, however, really this whole process is determined by the fats entering the mitochondria and the fats entering the mitochondria are always a blend of your dietary fat and your stored body fat. And so that's why, you know, that's where the SCD1 and the leptin and all the other things tie in is that everyone likes to think about changing their diet. But if you have these, all the stored reserves of polyunsaturated fats and monounsaturated fats, those are also going into your mitochondria yes. after a meal because free fatty acids are a blend of both. And so, you know, and it's probably the more I look at it, I think it's about 50, 50. Mm -hmm. So, so half of what's entering your mitochondria is determined by what you ate two hours ago. And half is determined by what's happened in your life for the past exactly. 30 years. This is big. <laughs> so you can't completely overwhelm it with diet. I think you have to think about both. This is big. And Dr. Kate has talked about this and it's yes. When you're first starting, it's like, yes, you did 40 years of damage and your cells are, are your fat fatty acid profile is all messed up and it's probably very unsaturated. And yes. And then that's why, uh, yeah. So there could be stalls, there could be all kinds of things that go on. So, 
just know it, it is a longer process to undo all the damage. And But then I've heard from this other crowd, that kind of pro-metabolic crowd, they're trying to say that's why you don't really want to fast. Or maybe some people have trouble because they, it is releasing all of these stored b body fat that, and then it's not as good, right? Because now you're burning all this stored, stored body fat. That's it, it, the unsaturated kind. Yeah, and and fasting, you know, one of the things that happens in fasting is your body makes all of these changes so that when you eat again to make sure that it stores it all, such as, for instance, fat it, fasting dramatically increases your level of SCD1. Surprise, surprise. It also does things like decrease the amount of uncoupling proteins that you make so that you stop doing this thermogenesis, which is like burning calories off as heat. So your body has a lot of ways to lower your metabolic rate in response to fasting. Um, another thing that happens is, another thing that's this is a real problem for losing weight is the less fat you have, the less leptin you make. And so that I think that's another reason that people stall out is like you were, you did have all this leptin and it was doing all these things and then you lost weight and now your leptin levels drop and now you're metabolically disadvantaged. I'm working on a blog post right mm. now. So that particular post is in my head. It's like these guys showed that um, after people lost 10% of their body weight, their metabolic rate declined by something like 23%. Um, so it's far out of proportion with the amount of weight that they actually lost uh, their metabolic rate drop. And, and specifically when they were doing, they put them on a bicycle and had them pedal slowly. And after losing 10% of their body weight, they were using 40% less energy to do the same amount of work on a bicycle mm. than before they'd lost yeah. weight because, because they didn't have the leptin. And then what they did was they gave them an injection of leptin. And all of a sudden, when they were doing the same amount of work on the bicycle, their, the amount of calories they burned went back to the pre-weight loss levels. And so because, again – you know, leptin is the main thing in charge of increasing your metabolic rate and driving all these mm -hmm. processes like increasing thyroid hormones so that you're burning calories more efficiently. And so that's another thing that we need to be thinking about going forward is like, how do we replace if we're losing fat and we're losing leptin, you know, what can we do to like replace the, that those metabolic effects or do they slowly come back over time or how does that work? But it's another that's, thing I'll be, it's another thing I'll be writing about and talking about. I love that stuff. I think it's kind of, uh, well, you're talking about kind of the constrained energy model. I read Herman Ponser's book, this guy who kind of uninvited yes. himself from my podcast because he heard that I went to see the Hadza <laughs> and they didn't eat any fiber. But I just talked about that. And I said, hey, I didn't say that they don't eat fiber. I just said we, Paul and I, you know, went visit the same Saladino, visit the same group a few days apart, and they were just eating meat and organs, and they didn't eat any fiber, and the women were chewing on tubers and spitting out all the fiber, and right, someone called me out on Twitter to him. Now he thinks that I thought I was some like Hadza expert and knew more than him when all I was talking about was my three day experience. So now he will no longer <laughs> sure. be on this show, even though <laughs> I see he will not be on this show anymore. But I, I read his book, Burn which is about the, what happened. Yes, they basically, these hunter-gatherers burn the same amount of e calories and energy that Americans do. So that's not it. Right. And, and it's also kind of talking about when you, what you're saying is when you lose a lot of weight, then your body wants to protect itself. And so it starts expending a lot less energy. And so that's right. exactly what you're saying. So you, they did the biking, but they expended 40% less. Right. And then this is a real slow... This is like a real slow. They were biking to generate 10 watts of power, which is not a whole lot of power. Mm -hmm. So this is like very like gentle biking. And that's and that's when they saw the biggest difference in in um metabolic expenditure between, you know, pre-weight loss and post-weight loss was like just like yeah. doing just getting up and walking around and just doing basic things. They were just using way less energy but the, than yeah. before they lost weight. And and that's what obviously that's what Probably 75% of our physical activity is, is getting up and walking around. And Well, that's I mean, why, yes, it, it's it's super interesting how your body works. So, yeah, you do have to address these things, and that's why people stall out. Or, yes, we have to figure out how to make it so it, you don't lose all of that metabolism, I guess you could call it. Right, you right. And, and, 
And that's and I'm hoping I'm hoping that if indeed if indeed I'm correct that the primary mechanism by which leptin in uh, exerts its metabolic effects is by increasing saturation levels um, through suppressing SCD1. I'm hoping that by you know using this sterculia oil and slowly changing over my body fat over the next year or however long it takes, I don't really know, um, that perhaps it's possible to replicate the effects of leptin that way and that then eventually, once the fat is lost, hopefully my body will readjust to its new level of leptin. But these are all kind of unknown questions, right? We don't yeah. know. This is what I'm. This is what I'm trying to figure out. Well, it's it's great. And then back to the fasting part too. I'm not saying it's bad to fast too. So many people have success with it. I think it's just there's yes. so many other factors too. And what what do we even consider fasting or how often? Yeah, maybe it's great to do every once in a while, do an extended one, but maybe just not. And even just not eating for 14 or 16 hours a day, I don't think that's fasting. That's just, I'm not hungry. Like I just, I, you know, right. or that could just be like completely fine. So also, yeah, I don't want to say there's something bad about fasting, but just, I'm saying this is troubleshooting, right? We're kind of talking about like, okay, what else is going on here? Maybe there's something going on. If you, you don't feel good when you start to do fasting, maybe it's because the 40 years of damage we're talking, you know, and the unsaturated fats are all coming out and trying to be used sure so you know maybe you could remedy that and maybe you could do some more things like okay well let's maybe not do the fasting or give your body some, some more yeah the, the saturated fats or stearic acid even the, the yeah. coffee you know put the yeah put the cocoa butter in your coffee and maybe that would help so your your body isn't relying on you know its own body fat and and it could be i kind of make fun of the bulletproof coffee idea but now it's like coming back around maybe it could work in a different way and it, it does have that benefit right yeah and one of the you know one of the women on another one of the testimonials um was a woman who had really good success of doing exactly that like she was using um you know she had been stalled out and weight loss for a long time and and started and she was mostly keto but she started she changed out her fats and she started using the cocoa butter in her coffee and she started, you know, eliminated everything. And that made a huge difference for her. And at first she, she lost, she said at first she was losing weight grams per day, you know? Mm -hmm. And then after three or four months, her weight loss accelerated until she like got, she dropped well below her target weight. And that was just with, you know, again, supplementing stearic acid, um, and and cocoa butter and where she could and just you know getting everything as saturated i think she cut out chicken and pork and substituted beef instead and just did things to just make her fat more saturated and she after struggling for like seven years and failing to lose any weight um got to her target weight in like you know three to six months just, just by literally, just by changing the fat ratios, and so, you know, I think obviously, yeah, it's going to work for all people differently, and there's all kinds of variables, and who knows. Um, but these are the wow. these are the things we're experimenting with over at Fire in a Bottle. So. Uh -huh. That's awesome. So, yeah, you know, we're running out of time. Oh, I have a few more. You wrote about how our metabolic rate and body temperature has plunged since 1919. Yes. So maybe you get good into that because we kind of teased that and yeah. talked about this stuff kind of. But. Uh, right. And so, yeah. And so that's, so that's one of the things is, is so um, there's a really interesting history of metabolic research. They, they figured out back in like the teens how to, how to test um, the amount of oxygen you were taking in and the amount of carbon dioxide you were breathing out. And they realized they could actually calculate your metabolic rate from that. So an interesting thing that happened is this guy, Benedict, um, came up with an equation. He did all these experiments in Massachusetts at Wellesley College, and he came up with an equation that predicts your metabolic rate based on your um, your gender, your age, and your height and your weight. All right, I think those are the only four variables. And if you give him those four numbers, he can predict your metabolic rate with pretty degree, high degree of accuracy that worked in Massachusetts in 1919. Right. And that's when his initial paper, that's when he published his equation and, and all the results of all these people. And by 1986 in America, that equation didn't work anymore. Um, when you, and this, and we're talking resting metabolic rate. So this is like people wake up first thing in the morning, they go, you lay down, you put this device on that's measuring your oxygen. So this is not like while you're walking around or doing anything else. And, but 
So there's maybe a 15% drop between 1919 metabolic rate and 1986 metabolic rate. And this woman came up with a new equation in 1986. Uh, to, to the, Yeah, I mean, they literally had to come up with a new equation because the old equation mm-hmm. didn't work anymore. Interestingly, and I haven't talked about this, there was also people trying to replicate this in different parts of the country. And what was happening was that in in southern states, like they did at the University of Florida and they did in Oklahoma, and in those states, they found that um, the metabolic rate was lower and was more like Americans in 1986. And then people at different colleges in the north tried it, and they were like, no, this equation is totally accurate. It, the equation is totally accurate. And they thought at the time it was – it was that people didn't need to burn as many calories where it was warm because you didn't have to stay warm. And they thought that's what it was. And then they went and they visited the Maya and no, in fact, the Maya living in a tropical culture were burning just as many calories as, you know, per weight and per height and per gender and per age as the people in Massachusetts. <laughs> so it went all around the world like this. And so I, in this, again, in this 1939 USDA, uh, your book of agriculture, what you can see is that in the by the 30s, um, people in the South were eating a lot more vegetable oil. And so I think that's why uh, people in the Southern states had, and, and, and most of these were done after, most of these studies were being done in the 30s and 40s. So in the 30s and 40s, I think people in the South already had a lower metabolic rate due to eating more vegetable oil and Crisco and, and, and all of the vegetable oils. Um, interestingly right now in Asia, you know, again, places where they eat a lot more starch and a lot less fat in general, and certainly less vegetable oil, although it's becoming more common. Um, they're rewriting the equation to predict higher metabolic rates. Mm. So like in Korea, there was just a study in mainland China and the people in mainland China, their metabolic rate was 15% above, um, you know, college students in Massachusetts in 1919. Um, And so, you know, you see as much as a 30% swing looking at the same person of the same age, the same weight, the same BMI, um, whether they're in mainland China versus people on a modern American diet eating a lot of vegetable oil. So um, it's, I think it's, I, I find it a fascinating thing that's like gone back and forth through the ages and everyone's comparing themselves to this initial Benedict equation. And is it still accurate? Is it high? Is it low? And, and it, it, it varies based on where people are. And I think what their diet was to bring one more point to that Benedict in the twenties uh, also measured, measured Asians in America and found that they had they had lower metabolic rates mm. than the white people that they tested. So we can't just simply say, well, the people in China for genetic reasons have higher metabolic rates because they actually yeah. uh, falsified that hypothesis way back when. And so I think that the, if ch- Chinese people do, in fact, have higher metabolic rates, and there's a lot of evidence that they do, I think it's because of diet, not because of genetics. Absolutely. Well, this is awesome. This is so cool because it kind of goes along with my last episode that maybe was confusing to some people, but this is probably helping people figure it out more. Everything you've talked about today, maybe they could follow you down that rabbit hole in the middle there with all the, the electron transport talk. Maybe not. I guess you can, <laughs> you can read his blog and try to uh, learn more about it. But uh, my recap is you want a good metabolism. You want a, a, a good temperature. Uh, I think a lot of people have a low temperature and they don't know it. Uh, that uh, that was me. You know, I was doing great and always I thought, but then I was like, oh, my hands are feet are a little cold. You know, let me look into this. I was kind of waking up in the night. I've talked about it here and there, but now I'm really you know measuring my temperature and realizing that uh, yeah, I need to like make make a few tweaks. Maybe don't go so low carb. You know, like I've always talked about just doing carbs on the weekends or maybe now I'm, for, I don't know how long it's been, almost a year doing them at night and uh, right. that helping and that helping, uh, you know, the, the, the carbs are the enemies, too many sugars and starches and refines, you know, these carbs probably are the enemy along with the vegetable oil though. It's kind of like that hammer and nail thing. I, I put up a graphic about like the seed oil, the poofas are like the real hammer, but then the nail that kind of drives the nail in the coffin 
is just like the excess uh, of just energy. Basically, you're just eating too much like sugars and starches just by eating all the processed food and then all the poovas come along with it. But basically, you you can have these starches or sugars in a safe way and in, in a healthy way in whole foods and you know what it could be whatever you choose uh even you know like honey or something and uh, it could help i think it is helping raise my temperature and raise my metabolic right. rate and so you you want a fast metabolism and maybe you could just put on your closing thoughts about why it's good to have that I mean, you're talking about these guys in 1939 crushing through calories like why is that a good thing well i i think that it's you know um i i just think that when i look around the world and knowing that like look at historical cultures like i just think that people used to eat i just think people used to eat more calories and i think that it's um i, I don't know that that's good or bad Maybe you can but, get more nutrients that way too. I mean, well, that's I mean, that's what they say in, yeah. in the USDA Book of Agriculture. It's like, yeah, the more food you eat, it's better because you're getting more calcium, and you're getting more vitamins, and you're getting more protein, you're getting more all these things, and it's all it's all to the good if you eat mm -hmm. more, right? If you can afford to eat and more, not which, get fat, yeah, <laughs> and right. But back then, fatness wasn't a problem, yeah. right? And and the richer you were, the more you ate, and the probably the healthier you were, and the longer you lived, etc. And so. You know, and so, and that's why I think, you know, I'm like, well, something changed. And, and, and that's, again, I, I think that the, that the vegetable oil was the triggering event. And then I think that our metabolism, uh, that's a trigger to enter into this torpid alternative metabolism. And then, you know, you start overproducing, overproducing SCD1 and your desaturase index goes up. And then you're, now you're in, now you're in like living in like this fat storing mode. And, and like yeah. you say, it's, it's associated with overeating. It's associated with storing fat. It's associated with all these things. And so it's like, I think we've, I think many of us have found our way into a torpid metabolism. And so mm. I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to figure out how to get out of get it. Out you of know? it. Yeah. You don't want to <laughs> eat for winter that, yeah, that you don't want to be getting ready for hibernation. And that's what right, right. we're in a and, perpetual and I, mode of that. Right. And I would argue that it might, it's probably, you know, I think a lot of people say, um, well, don't, when you say don't eat for winter, don't combine starch and fat. What I'm saying is don't combine starch and unsaturated. Exactly. Fat. That's, that's and, a next and, and, and figure out how to fix your body fats. Yeah. It's a longer term project. <laughs> longer term. Yes. <laughs> and, and part of the way to do that is get some good pork with low. That's Ufa. right. So come over to come over to Firebrand Meats. Yeah. Uh, we've got your low poofa pork. That's a thing. And um, if you check out Fire in a Bottle, we've got ninety percent pure food grade stearic acid products uh, that can help jumpstart your uh, you know your your dietary fat kicking around. And um, and I'm selling Sterkuli oil if you want to try to block your SCD one inhibitor. It's a nat it's a natural oil that grows on a tree and in tropical parts of the world. So that's fun. And I would also say, um, if people are interested in this topic, there's a great, um, discussion group on Reddit called r slash saturated fat. And it's, uh, it's sort of has nothing to do with me, but it popped up after I did the croissant diet. And that's a, been a really good discussion forum for mm -hmm. talking about these topics. So that's another place people can check out. Um, and obviously my blog is fire in a bottle and, um, I'm trying to think. Yeah, I, I'm fire underscore bottle on Twitter. If people want to follow me there, there's Facebook, but I'm not that active on it, honestly. Cool. Um, well, yeah, just <laughs> check out the blog and you, you'll find the, the other stuff there. I think it's great because, yeah, I, I'm going to get more into it. Maybe we can talk again offline about uh, the just getting the good diet for the pigs and yeah no i'd love to i'd love to yeah i think that's a, that's a that's an item that's very close to my heart so well i love that yeah that you you raise animals and do all this stuff yourself we could have probably gone down that rabbit hole if, sure <laughs> as well but uh i love that you're yeah just doing it right and getting the the good fatty acid profile oh so. i'm just gonna plug one more thing mm -hmm. so this is my new project it hasn't actually launched yet mm -hmm. but um I'm doing a series of little, I'm going to call them animated videos. They're not really animated. They're like little slideshows of silly drawings mm -hmm. about um, 
all of these like different stearic acid and linoleic acid and SCD1 as like little human characters and they're going to live in their own little fantasy world of the mitochondria and I'm going to have those uh, silly videos on, on YouTube and probably TikTok. So if, if you know, the idea is this is a, a, a more fun way to learn about this stuff rather than digging through the blog, which is pretty technical. So I'm, 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 I'm getting into silly videos now. That's cool. I actually <laughs> am just starting that myself. I actually have a guy, nice. an animator guy, and we're, we're doing little stuff. That's so funny that we both land on that. But uh, well, if you, you're still listening to this podcast, at least you made it through all the the deep dive talk and maybe you can uh, That's right. listen to it twice or get those cartoons and maybe they'll help you figure it out at the end. Uh, all right. Awesome stuff, Brad. It's been good talking to you. Uh, I got to yeah, get out of here, me. but uh, thanks so much. Right on. All right, everyone. Thanks for listening. Thanks for sharing with a friend. Thanks for giving this podcast a review on the Apple Podcast app or iTunes. I really appreciate it. It's a really easy way to help us out and get us spread to more people. Go to nosetail.org for all the meat delivered to you. That's the 48 United States. We have the seasonings. We have a few body care products in stock. More coming soon. We have the biltong and the drovors. And we also have the cutting boards now. You can also go to sapien.org to join the newsletter, join the tribe. This is the private club where we get to hang out and learn from each other. It's really cool. I love getting to know everyone and we have some great talks with Dr. Gary as well. You get the show notes, you get all kinds of perks, even a discount on Nose to Tail. That's at sapien.org and the Sapien program. If you need to make a lifestyle change, lose some weight, reverse disease, we have your back. We have remote programs, videos, all led by Dr. Gary. Check it out at sapien.org. Come back next week for another special episode. Thanks for listening, everyone. I'll see you soon.